I'm going to talk today about a kind of an independent project I've been working on in my free time, compiling a bunch of the observations that we get at the Satu Dad Lunch Center and trying to see what I can see what I can do with that and see where that goes from there. I'm going to kind of start out with a, with a quote from a man who's only my, my second favorite Donald. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld here. Uh, he's got a fairly, fairly famous quote. He says, there, there are things we know, known knowns, uh, things that we know we don't know are known unknowns, and then the things that we don't know that we don't know are unknown unknowns. And that relates quite well to a lot of what we do, what a lot we do with uh, snow and forecasting and avalanches. We have observations, our, our known knowns, points that we we know with some sort of confidence. We have uh, known unknowns, the spaces between our observations, the points that we interpolate between or extrapolate out to. And then our unknown unknowns are the kind of the things that we discover along the way that, that we didn't, didn't really expect at all. I guess for the background, I spent maybe seven or eight years working as a field geologist, running around in the mountains, banging on outcrafts with a rock hammer, Digging holes and essentially collecting a lot of collecting a lot of data based in space and trying to make some sort of sense of that and tell some sort of coherent story about that data. And the more I did that, the the more I realized that you know kind of do do a lot of that work in the summer and then spend my winters running around the mountains every single day, digging holes in the snow, looking at other sorts of data and realize kind of the similarities between those two those two different fields. That's kind of the backbone of this. Uh, so observations are known knowns, the, the backbone of, of really any forecast. You, you have to build, build your expectations about what the snow is going to do based off of what you've been seeing the snow do. And several different types of observations. Oh. Got our direct observations, pits and snowpack tests. This is Gabrielle banging around in the snow with a, with a shovel earlier this year. I think it's a Doug Chabot photo. Uh, another type of direct observation we have are our avalanche observations when you're kind of directly encountering avalanches, doing crown profiles, identifying, characterizing slab properties, weak layer properties, uh, that type of thing. This is Matt. He's a Billings guy. Some of you guys probably know him, co-worker over, over in Idaho. And the third type would be the observations you make as you're traveling through avalanche terrain. They're weather observations, snowpack observations. Uh, what's the wind doing? Is it, is it moving any snow? Looks like it's moving a little bit in this photo here. I think it was blowing too hard to really make slabs. It's just kind of blown it away into the atmosphere, but that's the way it goes sometimes. And we also have indirect observations, observations that were not not going out and making firsthand, but that we're, we're taking from a different source. And kind of two main types of these. We have our remote weather station ops. And this is a photo of, uh, can you just barely see there? That's the Flanders weather station. So that's up in highlight and nice long lens photo from over on the summit of the elephant. And another type of indirect observation, we have our, our glassing observations. So I personally like to spend a lot of time Looking around at the snow, uh, you can you can see a lot getting on top of the mountain and sitting there for an hour and a half and looking around and seeing what you see. This is Matt again here. You can ignore the duct taped on tow mirrors on our on our sled rig. <laughs> uh, observational scales. We have kind of at least for forecasting, we operate on like, three different scales. You might define uh, macro, meso scale, and uh, and the micro scale. And micro scales are often the often the, the bread and butter for a lot of forecasts. It's getting getting your your face in the snow and seeing what you see. Uh, a nice photo here of Doug demonstrating a bit of a non-traditional <laughs> snowpack <laughs> observation technique. I think he's been working on. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> the the <laughs> uh, Meso scale or what you might see kind of over the, over the course of a tour as you walk around, your, your weather observations, what the wind's doing, where avalanches are happening, uh, distribution of future weak layers, if you're seeing surface or in one area or not in another area, uh, 
you're seeing near surface facets form, facets forming somewhere, mapping that sort of thing out, and then your macro scale observations, which are often you need multiple days to really make a, a macro scale observation. But say it's more of a, a zone avalanche forecast zone observation or uh, an entire mountain range observation, and it takes a bit more bit more time to see than a day generally. So to orient, show you we're over there in Bozeman, obviously, given this talk, you can see the, the Galton zones outlined below us. And then Satu Avalanche Center is here based out of Ketchum. These are our four forecast zones, uh, kind of stretch between Ketchum and Stanley. Um, and just to give a brief, brief intro on, on what GIS is, I'm sure some of you have been exposed to it and some of you haven't, but GIS stands for Geographic Information System. And it's used to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, and uh, present spatial or geographic data, which, you know, I, like I said earlier, I was first kind of introduced to the concept of using that when I was doing a lot of stuff, often wandering around looking for gold, trying to, trying to make people who weren't me really wealthy, and uh, realized that there's a lot, of, a lot of similarities between that sort of observation and cataloging those things. Uh, as there is with with snow, and as forecasters, we're often we're often quite good at focusing on temporal scales, uh, seeing how much snow falls in a given period of time, how much water comes out of a storm, how a slab is changing properties over time, how things are strengthening over time. But then we we can also get a little bit lost in the weeds when it comes to spatial scales. We don't necessarily have a lot of a lot of tools that we use to identify spatial ch scale spatial changes over time. Uh, this is a, another little closer overview of our four zones. The center is based in Ketchum, like I said. This is Highway 75. Runs up through here, goes up and over Galena Pass, which uh, up to 8,700 feet. So Ketchum's a little under 6,000. Galena Pass is just under 9,000, and then drops back down onto the Salmon Riverside up to the town of Stanley, and the Sawtooth Mountains are in here. It's probably what most of you guys are familiar with, if you're familiar with the area at all. Uh, for scale of size, driving from Ketchum to Stanley is about an hour, and the highway obviously runs through the middle of two of these zones. It's a pretty unique, unique feature that, that we have. Um, so now we'll get into some of our, our known unknowns, the things that we know that we don't know so well. And this is kind of one, one area that this, this database that I created that catalogs all of these observations that we've been generating uh, this year and have gone back in time about six or seven years through the, through the available data that we have and kind of cataloged it into that. Um, when you think about observations that you might get, you, one thing that you might wonder about or think about is if they're, are they uniform in, in their spacing? Do you, do you have this equal grid where you have points all over the place and you can do nice clean interpolation between them or, or are they irregular? And so this map is showing that, particularly for us, and I would imagine for, for most folks, your observations are inherently irregular. So we've got, there's the highway run through again. Uh, the circles are individual observations, so the small unfilled circles are single observations, and the bigger the circle there is, the more points that we have, more observation points that we have from that location. And this is just showing the data from this year through a couple of days ago. Uh, and it's fairly apparent looking at it that you have this big, big cluster of observations <coughs> in this area near the pass, which is not particularly surprising because you can drive to nearly 9,000 feet and skiing's good and the access is easy. Are those observations you can make with binoculars? Um, you can make observations with binoculars at any of those points. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, was, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh, I'm just giving you a hard Oh, give it back. <laughs> hey Ben, are those grouped by like a, like a prominent feature or something? Or? Uh, they're grouped by a physical location. So, so I had to assign, you know, like you guys have your place names uh, file online. Uh, we have a similar kind of internal product, and I chose, I took that, I digitized those points, and uh, 
used Excel to basically grab names out of people's observations in our observation database, see where it is, and kick out a lat long for you. So those points are kind of like, the observations are grouped around that right and there and i grouped the kind of for simplicity and ease so you can actually see how many points are in one spot i grouped uh like for instance this, this big point here is a spot called titus ridge um goes take off right at the pass climb from the pass and it's can ski down so it's uh, just kind of lumped them so you could see how the kind of what your frequency of observations is and again this is just just this year's worth and show you a little bit of the little bit of the past terrain just to give you an idea the line in the middle there is the old the old road, but this is the the new road. There's a couple road reasons to clear that. It's after a big storm this year, but you can yeah drive up to 30 degree terrain, tons of powder skiing. It's pretty obvious why people like going there, and oftentimes it looks like this. This is not <laughs> inbounds. Uh, <laughs> this thing this is uh, called the cross. It drops from the summit here. You can ski the south face, maybe 800 feet right to the highway. And if you drive to the top of the pass, you can climb to the top of the cross in maybe 10 minutes. So you get a sense for why, why your observations are, are clustered. So back to this map, I took, those, took that cluster of observations and drew a little buffer around them as a way to kind of analyze where you get your observations from and how that might affect how you forecast for the rest of the zone. And in that little buffer, you get almost, almost 200 obs and that's from this year alone, are in that little buffer zone. And there's about 400, a little less than 400 total. So 56% of your OBS are coming from there. And it's 18 square miles out of an area of 400 square miles. So you've got a, you immediately see that you have, you have some sort of problem or some sort of issue that you at least need to contend with. So when you're, you know, if you're, oftentimes you get up in the morning and the guide groups love going up there because the access is easy and you might have three OBS from Galena Pass, and you're trying to forecast for an area that's you know, 20 times that size. Something that's clearly, at least, at the very least, need to keep in mind and decide how you, how you weight, your, weight your forecast towards that. And so the kind of couple of obvious issues of why you have that cluster of, this cluster of uh, observation points, one is easy access and then another unique thing that we have going on is a pretty extensive system of huts and yurts and this terrain is maybe six miles as the crow flies from Ketchum and there's a hut that sits down here at 8,500 feet and this is a 12,000 foot peak and these are in the upper, upper 11,000s so you have you get a snowmobile tow to just below there and you can access that sort of terrain and hang out there and ski there, and that, that influences where you're getting your observations from. Another kind of fairly interesting thing to think about when you're, when you're looking through observations is what, what sort of motivation you're getting from the people who, who submitted your OBS. So for guides, generally their primary concern is client safety, uh, and then they have secondary concerns of easy access depending on their client and Obviously, providing ski quality is a, a pretty big driver, but gets trumped by, by safety most often. For forecasters, safety is obviously our, our number one goal as well, and secondary is stability, assessment, and access. Uh, where you, you know, obviously, access, if you have a short period, short amount of time, you're gonna, it's gonna influence where you decide to go or where you decide not to go, but those kind of go hand in hand. And when you're in through public ops, sometimes it's pretty hard to tell what, what people's primary concern is. I think, I mean, started thinking about this, and it seems like safety would, would be up there at the top. But then you see how people travel around and what people do and what people Instagram about and that sort of thing, and, and it can be pretty hard to say. So public is, is a bit of a wild card. So we covered the distribution of distribution of observations, where you're seeing them in space, and then you know, take a quick look using that same information from the database about whose observations are coming from where. So we're back to this same map. You see, obviously, the big, big cluster at Galena Pass, and then I'm going to overlay where our avalanche center ops come from. And hopefully what it looks like is that we have a, 
you know, you obviously have this concentrated use area and you need to need to spend time in that area, but you're also seeing that, that we're traveling to a number of other more outlying areas and trying to, you know, in an effort to, to make a forecast that where you have a danger rating that's <coughs> averaged in some sense for the zone, you need to visit a good portion of that zone in order to, to make that sort of an assessment. Um, I mean, in, in any zone, you just have a huge, huge difference in terrain, huge difference in snowpack. Uh, like here on the on the west side of the highway, this mountain range is called the Boulders. Um, there's a lot of 11,000 foot peaks in there. Again, the highway goes from 6,000 to, to 9,000, so a lot of peaks with four or 5,000 feet of relief. It's kind of like driving through the Paradise Valley, but with three times the amount of mountains in there. They're a little bit closer. Uh, big windswept peaks. It's dry. You maybe get. 20 inches of water a year there. And then the Smokies, the, the rest of the zone here, far wetter, you get up to 40 inches of water a year. Uh, a lot of much more mellow, lower angle terrain, not nearly as rocky, not nearly as windy. So Ben, the, the red circles on that map, those are public observations. This layer are all observations lumped. So public, pro, and uh, Pro by guiding services and our observations, okay. and it's just the it's the same distribution layer. So the the bigger the darker the circle, the more that you're getting from one point. And then the key keys down there in the left. So the the big circle is that's the Titus Ridge spot. We got there's like 58 observations from from Titus Ridge this year. <laughs> Generally not particularly excited to get one of those when it comes in. So as far as what you can do with a, a database like this, uh, it's kind of important to recognize that there are programs entirely designed to, to deal with data that's spatially oriented. There's been tons of money put in by people that have a lot more money than Avalanche Centers to develop these things. And they're available for use. They're not, not necessarily cheap, but they're, uh, they provide you with a, with a huge amount of stuff. And, Use them to record and analyze the observations you get, your, your known knowns, identify and strengthen the things that you know you don't know, maybe your holes between your observations, deciding where you need to go on any given day, uh, deciding where, what your distribution of a given week layer is if you're worried about service or across your zone, if it's only been reported in a spot or two, and uh, increasing, increasing the awareness of the fact that there, there are going to be things that you know, know that you don't know. I'll give you a Real quick, we'll go back to our favorite map here. Quick little case study of the, the unknown unknowns. So if you look, you've got this huge area in the southwestern quarter that has a handful of OBS, and all of these OBS are from uh, Sun Valley Heli, the heli ski guiding operation, because that terrain is, is basically inaccessible to anybody who doesn't have a helicopter. Even, I showed some photos of Matt earlier, he's a He's an expert snow biker, snowmobile rider, and he doesn't get back there. People just don't go back there. So you've got this portion of your zone that's accessed, accessed frequently. People are there all the time, but it's a fairly small and specific group of people. And they had a, it was a really interesting weather setup this winter. We had a storm that dumped snow. I drove up, let's see, Matt was skiing up on the pass, came down that night, it was dumping snow on the road. <laughs> We crossed on the way, I went up and skied up here on Galena Peak, dumping snow the whole way, snowing on the road the whole way. And that night we started to get observations from the heli ski guides that it had rained. And our first, it rained up to 9,000 feet. And our first, uh, first reaction was to be somewhat confused and to not, not necessarily know what they were talking about. And I went, I went looking for that and I couldn't find any rain here, any evidence of a rain event here, couldn't find any evidence of a rain event here. Uh, but up at this point was the was one spot that I found it at 8,000 feet or a little bit higher. So we were able to verify that there actually actually was an issue with that. And actually the next day they had, a, uh, they had an incident where they had a guide caught and carried by an avalanche that occurred on that rain crust. And the point, the point of that is to say that you have there's, there's always going to be things that you don't know, you don't know. You don't even, don't even know to expect them. You know, we knew that it might have snowed more at the pass than it did in town, or it snowed more in the Sawtooth than it did at the pass. 
but generally you're not thinking that if it's snowing at 6,000 feet, two miles away it's snowing at 9,000 feet. Uh, looking forward, what I'd like to do with this is, I mean, obviously, Snowpilot is a deep database of uh, snowpack information, and incorporating that into a database like this would be a really interesting thing to do. Uh, incorporating weather station data, making layers out of that, and, and overlaying them. Uh, one really interesting tool, I think, that this or way that this tool could be used is as a way to create records from people in the community who have been around for a long time. You know, you'll be out skiing with someone who's spent a lot of time in an area, and they'll point up at a slope and say, oh, that avalanche once in 83 or something like that. And you look at it, and you can't even imagine that that could be possible. And using a tool like this, you can, instead of letting that knowledge kind of fade and, and die in those people's minds, you can, uh, you know, basically record it in a way that will be shared and can be shared with, with all sorts of other people over time, as opposed to being kind of a just having a resource that if they move away or if they do something else that they don't have that anymore. And uh, I think digitizing, yeah, digitizing historic records of avalanche cycles and current records. And that's one, just do one more, one more quick thing here. That's something that I've been doing the last, kind of looking at the last two years and then had a really, really neat sort of avalanche cycle. Uh, it's the 22nd, we had a big, big atmospheric river event, 22nd of March, so. Friday, I think that was, and it rained and snowed inch and a half to two and a half, two and a half inches of water in 24 hours. Uh, some areas got, you know, pushing two inches of rain up to 8,000 feet, and we had a pretty neat uh, avalanche cycle. It kind of varied heavily by heavily by elevation. On your upper elevation stuff, you saw a lot of more classic kind of wind loaded wind loaded wind slab avalanches. But as you step lower, you start to see some really interesting wet slab avalanches. And uh, I've been, I spent some time up high glassing where we see a lot of these, recording where we're finding those, uh, digitizing those crowns onto maps, and I'm going to do a, kind of do an aspect and elevation analysis of those things to see what sort of, if either of those things affect where you're seeing different types of avalanches. And uh, just a really neat, really neat cycle. You can see crowns. That's a big crown. That's a big crown. That's a big crown. So you look around, you see your nice classic avalanche or alpine wind slabs, and you start looking around more, and you're seeing these deeper, deeper wet slabs that are going on, probably a layer we buried in, in mid February. And GIS is a, just a terrific tool for, for identifying those sorts of things. And, and studying them, some more, more 30 degree slope crowns, deep crowns, and one more. Got it. This whole bowl went. This went mid storm. Uh, obviously, you're getting more into your alpine flavor up here. And then, if you look closely, these are all snowmobile tracks from the next day. Same aspect, a little bit higher. <laughs> Not really sure what to make of that, but. So thanks to all the guys at the side of the Island Center, Matt and Ethan and Scott, and then these are the kind of three guide groups who submit tons of apps for us. And that's it.